Romans chapter 5, verse uh, 21. Well, let's, let's go up to verse 20, okay? Um, so Romans chapter 5, verse 20, we'll read that one in verse 21 also. It says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And that's good to know, amen, that, that no matter how bad it seems, no matter how bad sin seems to be gaining power even in the earth, where, where the things that we're viewing, you know, uh, happening on the earth, that the Word of God tells us that even though sin abounds, grace much more abounds. That there's not enough sin to exhaust God's grace. And, and I want you to know that, that whether it be on the earth or in your own life, um, it doesn't give us a license to sin. It doesn't make it okay that we sin. But it's important that people know, like in that song, how it was singing, that it hadn't gone too far. You know, you, you've never gone too full, far. And it's important for people to understand that, that the love of the Father, that he, he's, the Bible says in the Old Testament that he's married to the backslider. And that you can't, out, you can't, you can't exhaust God's grace. Praise God. And so verse 21 says that as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And you can go ahead and go to Romans chapter 7 verse 9 because that was the verse that I really wanted, originally was going to start with. But what I did want to say about that is as we were singing that song and thinking about the king is that this word in here about reigning, that as sin has reigned, now grace can reign. Grace will reign. And grace reigns in the lives of those that allow Jesus to be their king. Amen. Grace reigns in the lives. And, and listen, it's very important that we understand grace. I know we write, I know we write the definition on the board a lot. And 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 this and you know the definition is a one of the definitions is a divine influence on the heart and its uh, reflection in the life. And so basically though what it's saying is is that that the grace of God does a, a job on the inside of our heart and that he changes us. And, and whenever we learn to yield to the will of God and we learn to allow Jesus to be the king of our heart and our life, then, then we're yielding, as we're yielding to the will of, will of God, the grace of God is transforming us. See, that's what, we, that's what you need and that's what I need. We need the grace of God to transform us. We don't need what we think we need. We need what the word of God says that we need. We need God to move in our life and to transform our lives. We need God to break the power of sin over our lives. And we need God to form and fashion Jesus on the inside of us so that we would start to look more like our king, amen, and less, and less like us. And so really that's part of what part of my message is about. I was going to talk to you about law and talk to you about the concept of sin. And so in, in this particular verse, and, and we're going to kind of come back and dissect it a little bit. But it says, for I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Now, this is an important verse of scripture right here. Um, and there's a lot of different opinions about this particular scripture and exactly what it means. And uh, you, you'll hear differences of opinions between a lot of Baptist scholars versus, uh, you know, really and truly, I would say that the majority of people probably don't necessarily even agree with, with my take on it. Uh, when I learned it from Brother Larson, and whenever I, I'll tell you this, I was watching a video, and whenever the brother said it, this was a long time ago, the Holy Spirit fell in my living room, and the Holy, and the Holy Spirit was witnessing that, that this is what, what the Lord was saying. Amen. So, <clears throat> could you go to, I want you to see a couple of different translations, though, and we're going to come back to it, talk about it in a second. You see how the word sin revived, how it's worded right there? Could you go to the uh, NASB real quick? I, just, I want you to flip to that one, and then we'll go to the ESV next. So uh, it, look what it says. So sin became alive is what it says in the NASB. It's a little different than the word revive, right? It's actually a lot different, but we're going to talk yeah. about that in a second. And then if you could go to the ESV maybe, and, and we'll see what that one says. It says sin came alive. See, different than revive, right? And then if you would actually put the Amplify. I, the Amplify says a lot of things I don't like. But, but I wanted you to see, you see how it says, it says, and sin lived again, okay? And so that's a little bit more like revived, 
to be honest with you, where it says in the Amplified, sin lived again, all right? And so we're going to break that down in a moment, but what I want you to know is, is this, is that whenever we come to faith in Christ, that the miracle that happens whenever a true conversion takes place, uh, when the Holy Spirit moves in, according to the Word of God, the old man that was born of Adam dies, amen? That's what the Scripture teaches. It teaches it in Galatians chapter 2, Romans chapter 6. It tells us in Colossians chapter 1 that that we were translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And, and it teaches us that a transformation miracle takes place on the inside of our heart and on the inside of our lives, right? And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is, why is it that so many Christians struggle with having Christ formed in them? Okay, because see, the work of the men, the work in ministry of the Holy Spirit is like we said that what Paul said that Christ would be formed in you. Amen. And so that and like John the Baptist said that I would decrease so that he would increase. Amen. And so that's the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, patience, kindness. Self-control. Whenever, whenever we yield to the will of the of the Lord and the grace of God is moving in our life, we're being crucified. Our old man is being crucified, and Christ is being formed in us. Does that does that make sense? But but unfortunately, if we're honest, a lot of times now we've all struggled with it from time to time, all right? And we still from time to time find ourselves not lining up with the Word of God. Okay. But sometimes people like really in the struggle. And, 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 and I want to just kind of point out that sometimes there's two different reasons. I mean, there could be more, but this is two different reasons for tonight. And, and one reason is that they're kind of like Israel was with Jesus on that day. Whenever they said, no, he's not our king. We don't have a king. We only have one king and it's Caesar. So. Whereas many times people have received Jesus as their savior, like they ask Jesus to come in to, to save them because they don't want, you know, saying they won't go to hell. Not, nobody really wants to go to hell. I mean, some people think they want to go to hell, but they really don't want to go to hell. And most people that have heard the gospel and have yielded to it and accepted Jesus, they accepted him as their savior. And they said, they said, yes, Lord, thank you for dying for me and please forgive me of my sin. And a lot of times we mean it. Right. But that's just the beginning. I, I used to say it a lot. I used to say, listen, if you met the president, and I think the first time I said this, maybe George W. Bush was president or something. Uh, said, if you met George W. Bush and, at a rally or something and you shook his hand and you said, hey, yes, yes, Mr. President, my name is Matt Abair. And he said, well, nice to meet you, President Bush. Well, so actually, in a sense, I'm kind of an acquaintance with him now. At least I've been, not, maybe I'm not acquainted, but I've at least been introduced. I've been introduced to him. I know, he, I know, he, I, he, you know, he knows, he would probably not remember my name, but he knows my name. But what I'm trying to say is this, is that when we first get saved, can I tell you, when we truly do get born again for the first time, that basically, that's just an introduction that's just an introduction to Jesus. Now the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of our heart, right? And now we're to work on our relationship. And that's where we're, he's going from being our savior to being our king. Where, where we're learning to yield to his will and allow him to rule and reign in our lives. Amen. And, and so the problem that we run into, though, is that. Things get in the way. So number one, we, we, we don't want to yield and allow him to be the king of our life. We still want, to some extent, to rule on the throne of our heart. Listen, that is true. That there's times in the lives of people, myself included, and really everyone in this room included, at some point in time, that after we got saved, first of all, if we got saved, that's the that's the big that's a big deal. We gotta make sure we're saved, my friend. Okay, and then and then once we're saved, learning how to yield to the will of God, it doesn't really matter what you want to do. Come on, it doesn't really matter what Pastor Matt wants to do. There's God's will, and then there's my will. And Jesus taught us in the garden, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And the lifelong journey of the Christian. If we're really growing in Christ, if we're really allowing Jesus to be formed in us, 
is all about that. It's all about us dying and us yielding and us allowing God, the Holy Spirit, to have his way to form Jesus in us. Yeah. Amen? And some people would <laughs> be like, well, that's what I do. I, I don't smoke anymore. Well, hallelujah. You know, or I don't do this anymore. I don't do that anymore. And, you know, I've just been real thinking on my, hopefully, I, you know, it, it's going to get better there, love. But, you know, I was, I've used that as an example the last couple of days even. But what about if I'm condescending to my wife? Like in the conversation, what if, I, what if I'm condescending? Okay, and what if you're condescending to someone? Or what if, you're, what if, what if, what if you have a bad attitude? Do you know that if you have a bad attitude? Do you know that if you have a bad attitude and you're conflicted on the inside of your spirit, that you're walking in something that is not of the Lord? That you're walking underneath the spirit, uh, you'd be walking underneath the spirit of rebellion? And that you're outside of the will of God. And the enemy wants to keep you in that spot. He wants to keep you in that spot. He wants you to, he wants you to walk around with a bad attitude. He wants you to be frustrated and aggravated. So, and, and that you wouldn't yield to the will of God to let Christ be formed in you. right? And so that's the first thing is, and I just wanted to say is that sometimes people don't want Jesus to be their king. And, but then the second thing for tonight is this. Is that people just don't really understand how to let Jesus be their king. Their faith is scattered. It's kind of like a wave tossed on the ocean with every wind of doctrine. Every wind of doctrine that comes around and comes into the church. And it just tosses people and to and fro, to and fro. And, and they don't really know where to anchor their faith. And if you don't know where to anchor your faith, you can't surrender yourself to that truth. And that's part of that verse right there. So one of the big things about seven, Romans chapter 7 verse 9, you can put it back up in King James real quick, is that the argument is this. Okay. Yeah, just hit us with the King James if you don't mind when you get a chance. So the argument is this, is that the Baptist would say that this, and I'm not picking on the Baptist, I'm just letting you know the difference. Okay. They would, they would say that this was before, because he says, what, what shall we say that, is this, I want verse 9, I'm sorry, chapter 7, verse 9. He says, I was alive without the law once. So what the Baptist scholars would say was that that was talking about the Apostle Paul when he was young and didn't understand the law, okay? So in other words, at an age where he didn't understand the commandments, he didn't understand the law, and then once he did understand the law and the commandments, then sin suddenly came alive. And that would be more consistent with the, the NASV version, right, that we read. Sin came to life, or the other one that said sin sprang to life, right? But, but that what I'm trying to tell you is that that's not what's being said here. What's being said here is that this is after the Apostle Paul has been a Christian, so now we're talking about the mighty Apostle Paul who died for the faith, was willing to have his head cut off under Nero. No one, no one could stop him from moving forward to Jerusalem, even though he already knew in his spirit that he was going to die once he got there. Okay, this man right here is saying that there was a time in my life that I, after I became born again, okay, and I can prove it to you, but we'd have to go back to the first Five verses of chapter 7 and I don't know that we're going to have time for it I'm just trying to make a point that he says there was a time after my conversion that I was alive without the law and then I went back to the commandment I went back to the law I added something in addition to my trust in Christ and what he had done for me at the cross and whenever I did that, it caused a problem in my spirit, man. It caused sin to gain power in my life. And he goes on to explain like around verses 23 and whatnot. He says, he says, the thing that I wanted to do, I couldn't do. And the thing that I didn't want to do, that is what I did. And then he says, oh, wretched man. Who is going to deliver me from this body of, body of this death right there? He says, who's going to deliver me? 
And then I think it's the next verse. He says, I thank God uh, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, and then this particular verse, I wasn't going to go there, but since it's there, other people would say, so with the mind, meaning I know right from wrong, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And I can't tell you how many people that love God through the years that said, see there, it's the flesh. And so therefore, I have, I, we just can't help it. We're going we're gonna to end up sinning. No, that's, but that's not what it's saying. If we walk in the flesh, if we allow ourselves to be led by the flesh, if we let the flesh be our king, if we let the flesh rule and reign, then we're going to live under the dominion and the bondage of sin. But if we learn how to be led by the Spirit, and the Spirit's telling us, oh, wretched man that you are, who's going to deliver you from this body of death? His name is Jesus, and he's already done it, and he said it is finished, and now it's time for you and I to learn to trust and to yield and to say, yes, Lord, I believe you did it. But see, there's this struggle that goes on between the person that says, no, we have no king but Caesar. Or else, I just don't understand it and I'm putting my faith in. You know, it's important. Every time I turn around since I've been saved in the 80s, because I love to, I like to try to understand the different trends that are happening in the church. Now, listen, we might all have different opinions about demon spirits in here. Okay, like with the, who who they can attack, how they attack, whether they get in. I'm gonna come up Christians. I don't, I don't think that any of us would have a, a a difference of opinion of how demon spirits affect unbelievers. I think we would all probably be on the same team there, right? I think that if we're gonna have a problem, it, it would be how do they affect believers? Can they get in you? Can they get? And I, I do not believe that a Christian can be possessed. All right, now that, I'm not talking about. But I am telling you something. I'm very concerned that, that there's a shift that's taking place with all this demonology stuff. Meaning that the new pathway, it seems like, that they're trying is, is now, oh, you just need to be delivered. Right. Well, hold on a second. There may be a time and a place to take authority over, but that's not normal Christianity. Christians are not supposed to be walking under the bondage and influence of a demonic spirit. And as a matter of fact, let me tell you this. More times than not, the problem that we have is our flesh. Yes. And I like the way that I heard two different preachers say it. You can't cast out the flesh and you can't crucify a demon. Yeah. And the reality of it is, is that many times our flesh doesn't want to die and it doesn't want to let Jesus be king. It wants to hold on to its pride. It wants to do it the way it wants to do it. And it says, no. I'm not going to yield to you, Huggy. I'm not going to yield to you, Wifey. I'm not going to yield to you, Boss Man. I'm not going to yield to whatever it is because I'm my own sovereign nation over here and I'm going to do it my way and I'm not going to pay my taxes. I'm just trying to make a point. Amen. I'm going to do it my way. That's a problem. Amen. I know used to say that when they, we have liftoff, Houston, we have a problem. We have a spiritual problem when we refuse to yield to the will of God. All right. So, so what, what, what I'm trying to say when we go back to Romans chapter 7 verse 9 is that no, he was a believer. And then he started adding something else. Whatever it is. Something else to his faith. And whenever you do that, according to Galatians chapter 2 verse 21, you frustrate the grace of God. So if the grace of God is a divine influence on the heart, the inner man, and is causing a change on the inside where it can become reflected outwardly, then whenever we begin to change the object of our faith to anything else other than Christ for victory, I'm talking about for righteousness and victory, then what we do is, is that we frustrate the grace of God. And when we frustrate the grace of God, the power of God is not moving and operating in our lives. All right. So, Really and truly, the topic of tonight's message is more for those that want Jesus to be their king, but maybe don't really understand exactly how to, to surrender to this truth that's going to allow the grace of God. Because see, nobody can help you but, but the Holy Spirit and yourself working on this together if you have not let Jesus be your king yet. Yes. 
I, and don't sit in here thinking that you're exempt, my friend, whoever you are. I mean, if I make eye contact with you, I ain't trying to pick on you. I'm just saying, come on. Like, I'm just trying to make a point. Whoever you are, don't think that you're exempt if you sit in here. We're just a small little crowd, but you may be trying to run the runner of your own ship. Yeah. Steering your own ship. Right? And refusing to yield in certain areas of your life. And because of that, have not surrendered to the will of God. Because half of you, a lot of you already know. Come on, I'm telling you the truth. Most of you already know what I'm talking about in Romans. You know, I've heard it so long for so many years. Come on. And now maybe 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 the deep revelation hasn't come in because it's one thing to hear it. I agree. It's one thing to hear it. It's one thing to have knowledge about it. It's a whole other thing to have revelation from the Holy Spirit for yeah. it to enter your heart. And I'm willing to admit that. Holy Spirit, give us revelation. Yes. Amen. Yeah. But 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 we can have a pretty good understanding, and yet at the same time know that there's things in our life that we're refusing to yield, and then we wonder why yeah. these things are going on. You get the point, right? So this topic is for those people that want to yield. Because look, I'm, I'm going to tell you this too. I love that scripture. Can you put 2 Corinthians chapter 13? And I don't even know which verse it is, but it's the very last verse of the chapter. 2 Corinthians 13. It says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and look at that, the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. And I, I've preached this many times, and you might, y'all might even be getting tired of it now. But that word communion in the Greek is koinonia, and one of the main, it can also be translated as fellowship. And one of the main meanings of the word is joint participation. That means that when you and I hear the gospel, we ha have a part to play. With our free will, we yield and surrender and work with the Holy Spirit. That means when he speaks to us about something in our life, we surrender. We don't ignore him. We don't say, no, Caesar is our king. We don't say, no, I'm going to do it this way, even though I feel like no. And no. Because, see, when we, when we don't yield to the Holy Spirit and we reject his pleas and we reject his whispers and we reject what he shows us, what we do is we harden our own hearts. And we make it more difficult for our spiritual ears to hear what he's saying to us. And everybody that's here tonight on a Wednesday night, you know you love the Lord because you wouldn't be here. Amen. And so if we're and so if we're we don't it doesn't make any sense to sit in the house of God. <laughs> I have to tell you, it doesn't make any sense in my opinion. Now maybe I'm wrong. To sit in the house of God if we really don't want the Lord to be our king. Yes. <laughs> Come on. Well, what, what are we doing? We, you know? Oh, well, it's because. Because they, there's nobody in this place that actually thinks that you can punch the church clock and be okay. Not, not, not one, as, as I scan the room and I think to myself, surely there's not one person in this place that thinks that just because I showed up at church tonight, it's going to help me to be better. Now, you <laughs> might be thinking, I'm not where I need to be. And if I show up in the house and God, God will do something. Praise God. And if that's, if that's what you were thinking, then that's, that's a good thing. And amen. All right. So, so that's who we're talking about tonight, or talking to tonight, is those that would want to that need to understand that I was alive once without the law. But how, what does that mean? How, how does this happen? What does sin revive mean? And we're going to get into that here in a moment. But uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the law. Okay, let's go to Galatians chapter three, uh, verse twelve. Could you put it in the ESV for me for for this verse of scripture? Galatians chapter three, verse twelve. It says, uh, but the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Now, would you go to, to Romans chapter 10, verse 5, and keep it in the ESV version? But I'm, while she's going there, she's pretty fast, though. I've already noticed that. I'm going to read to you Leviticus 18.5. You, because that's where Galatians 3.12 comes from. Paul quotes it from Leviticus. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. Now look at Romans chapter 10. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law. That the person who does the commandments shall live by them. I don't, my, my chalk is getting small. But I, but what was the word that that kind of sticks out to you that was repetitive in all three of those verses? Did any particular word 
stick out to you by any chance? I mean, it's not a pop quiz. If you don't know, then <laughs> huh? The word that stuck out to me that I have highlighted. It's not fair, but it, but it's this word right here that the person who does the commandments, right? So so the word does or there's a there's a doing. That was the same word was used in each one of those uh, passages of scripture. A doing. Right now, now let's take a look at some other passages of scripture. Let's look at uh, let's look at Romans chapter four, verse three. In Romans chapter four, verse three, it says, and we can keep it in the ESV. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Okay, now, now let's go to verse 5. And it says, And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. All right, now let's go ahead and real quick, let's go to uh, Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 through 7. And we can keep it in the ESV. It says, Just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Now, let's skip down to, chapter, to verse 9 in Galatians chapter 3. And it says, so then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So there were two words that stuck out in all those passages of scripture to me. Does anybody want to take a shot at what you think was consistent in those Verses of scripture. Anybody want to say anything? Okay. To me, the words were faith or believing, right? So to believe, or we could say to have faith, right? And so there's a there's a there, the difference between the two is we have law and we have new covenant grace, and one is focused on doing, and the other one is focused on believing. All right. And so that's the difference between the two. Right. And, and so whenever we're whenever we're in the process of doing what ends up happening is, is that we're focused on performance. Right. I think we, we watched we all watched a, a video recently a while back that was and he was talking about performance based was a performance based Christianity or performance driven Christianity. And I used to use that word performance a long time ago too because the focal point is on performance. I have to do this. See, you got to understand that's what the law was all about, that the believer had to do it and that the believer in the Old Testament did not have access to the Holy Spirit living on the inside of him, empowering him and giving him strength. So he was told by the law what he was supposed to do, but he ended up having to try to do it in his own power and in his own strength. And see, the scripture says that if you're going to live, it's the one who does the law that's going to live in the law. And then it says, and if you fell in one point, you failed the whole thing. And so the Lord gave us the law for many purposes. But, but one of the purposes, well, two, let me just say two tonight. One was to reveal to us his character before Jesus came. The second was to prove to mankind that we couldn't do it on our own. And so that's one of the things that, that I wanted to, to tell you that the Lord, I've kind of added this to my notes. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 3, it says this. It says, so then, uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 3, and it doesn't matter what script or <laughs> translation you use. It says, and it said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So there's a lot of characteristics we could talk about regarding children, right? But, but, but what he's talking about is, is us learning that we have to be dependent yeah. on him, yeah. right? Yeah. And we can't be independent. We have to learn yeah. how to be dependent. Yeah. Because when we're independent, we think we can do it, right. right? And we're sitting here focused on our performance. And then the next thing you know, when we fail, and, and look, I want to kind of, I kind of want to switch it up on you a little bit. And I don't know that I've ever personally thought this way before, but, I, but I'm thinking about it right now. 
that many times we looked at performance driven or performance based Christianity and we were like, if I'm going to please God, then I need to do this. And listen, I used to overcorrect this, so I'm going to be careful. But what I used to always talk about was this, is that whenever we feel like we were failing God, we would try to pray more. We would try to read more. We would try to go to church more. I want to be very clear on this, that number one, Christians pray. Amen. Number two, Christians love the word of God for your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Amen. I hide your word in my heart that it might not sin against you. Amen. The word of God is, is you can't live for God without the word of God. You're not going to be able to live for God without the word of God, uh, you know, without at least understanding what the word of God says. Without at least understanding the word, which is Jesus and him living in your heart and you yielding to that truth. All right. And so because, it, OK, I'm not going to get into that too much, but, but this is the thing. And, and listen, people that are saved and have the Holy Spirit living in them. Guess where they want to be? They want to be in church because they want to be around other believers. And if you don't want to be around other believers, I'm, listen, I'm not trying to be rude. I promise you I'm not, because I can tell you right now as the pastor of this church, there's been plenty of times I didn't want to be around other believers. I'm just being honest. I had a bad attitude. And people irritated me. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I know I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> and like other people, I probably thought some Christians were lame or something. I don't know. Because I was so cool. Yeah, like whatever. <laughs> okay, but I'm admitting to you that I felt that way before. Amen. I don't feel that way now. <laughs> oh. There's no place I'd rather be. Yeah. Then in the house of God with people of like-minded faith yes, yes. that love Jesus, amen, that want to worship yes, the King, yes. praise God, that want to give Him glory and honor. And you know, I'm going to tell you something, that's a beautiful thing. If we just, if we just learn to rest, you know, and, and learn to realize that worship and coming into the house of God is really not... It's not as much, it's not about us. And I know we get, we get the overflow of the blessing, amen? We do, because we'll be enriched in our walk with God as we understand the word of God a little bit better and as we worship the Lord in his presence. I don't know if y'all, I don't know what it felt like for everybody else during worship, but I'm telling you right now, I at some point in time, all of a sudden out of nowhere, I can feel the Holy Spirit just ministering to my heart. And I'm so grateful for that. But I've got to tell you something. It's not even really about that. No, I'm so thankful. As a matter of fact, I want to give you glory and honor. Lord, thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence in this place. And thank you for letting me feel your presence. Because there's been times in my life that I haven't felt the presence of God. And thank you for ministering to my heart, Lord. But what my understanding is this, is that it's not really about me. It's all about him. It's all about him and that he's worthy. Yeah. And I can tell tonight, I, I hate to admit it, sometimes I'll look behind me a little bit to see if everybody's feeling something. <laughs> Lord, forgive me. Well, if that's wrong, forgive me. And, and I can tell that, I can tell that he was ministering to y'all. You know? And y'all can feel the presence of the Lord. And that's, see, that right there, whenever we all come together corporately and we all, we all release, it's so important too. I think we should all at least learn Listen, Micah sent out a video of this Kim Walker Smith or whatever, and I watched it. And she was talking about how instead of using the word entertainment, she used the word industry. How the industry affected worship. It's kind of like how you could say entertainment affected worship. Because, see, worship service is not supposed to be about entertainment. Yes. It's not supposed to be about me coming in. Now, I'm grateful for good musicians. I'm grateful for, for good singers. And as a matter of fact, if you have good singers and good musicians, you probably, I know this is going to sound ugly, but you probably ought to not let bad ones up there to mess it up. Okay. But, but, if, but if you don't have any music, and if the pastor wants to throw out a song, even though it don't sound good, hallelujah, just go ahead and bear with it, amen? Because, because it's really about giving worship to the king. And you know, it's a beautiful thing, and some of us might fall down on our knees and cry on the altar, and some of us might jump up and down, and some of us might even feel every now and then like running around the church, and some people may not feel like doing that. But I want to encourage you, at the very least, start to sing to your king. Sing to your king. Even if it's just a little bit of a whisper. Come on. Release some sound vibrations from your lips and out of your mouth to the king of kings and the lord of lords. Because he's worthy. Yeah. He's worthy. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. And I believe that when we do that, it makes a difference. It makes a difference. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So what I wanted to say is this, is that <laughs> going, okay, I wanted, so, so what we're talking about is the difference between doing and believing. New covenant Christianity is believing, believing something. Amen. Uh, believing, believing what the word of God says about who you are now in Christ. Believing what the word of God says about who Christ is in you. But believing what the word of God says, what happened to you when you put your faith in Christ. Amen. The, the word of God says that the old man that was born of Adam died with Jesus. And do we believe that? Amen. And if we do believe that and we continue to hold on to that, then it now it gives the flow of grace into our life and we yield to that. And the more we yield to the will of God, the more that we work with the Holy Spirit and the more he changes us. Amen. Amen. Whereas if we're trying to do it. Now, what I was going to tell you earlier is this, is that many times people try to do something to gain favor with God. They don't realize they're doing that. They're not. Like saying, I mean, has anybody ever been there before? Am I the only one? <laughs> Thank you, sis. Whenever the Lord started working in me and I realized, you know what? One time I was in Venezuela. I'm going to give you an illustration. One time I was in Venezuela on a land job for about 35 days. I was in the oil field and I was jogging at the time, right? And I'm jogging down the road and they got fruit trees everywhere. And I'm looking and now this is before I had victory in my life, but I remembered it very vividly after the Lord started to give me victory in my life. And there was fruit that had fallen off the tree and was just rotten on the ground. Because, I mean, there was more fruit than what people could pick. It was just everywhere. Fruit trees everywhere. And when the Lord got a hold of me, what I began to realize was, is that it was like the problems that I had in my life, the sins that had plagued me, that I was trying to work or to do something to get rid of them, but they never would go away. That all of a sudden, whenever I started to believe that what Jesus did already set me free. And then when the revelation came, I remember jogging down that road. And I was like, it's almost like the fruit, the very, the sin, let's call it sin fruit. The very sin fruit that I was trying to do something to get rid of and could never get rid of it. Once the Holy Spirit, once I allowed the Holy Spirit to have his way in me through faith in what Christ has already done. The stuff just started falling off. And that's whenever I do No. This gospel message is real, my friend, because the Lord's doing it in my life and I'm not having to do it. But this is what I want to say about doing also. Do, the doing of, of religion, the doing of Christianity. Okay, it's not true Christianity, but the, no, there is a doing in true Christianity. But what about whenever, what about whenever we, if we do understand intellectually what Christ did for us? Okay, and then we fall short of the glory of God. And then the next thing you know, we're, we're not able to, we don't feel freedom in our heart. We feel condemnation and guilt because we let the Lord down, right? And then the next thing you know, we start trying to do different things to try to make it right with God. And what I'm trying to say is this, is that that's, as bad if not worse. Yes. Then believing. Believing what? The scripture says in 1 John chapter 1 that we have an advocate with the Father. John said, I we tell you these things so that no man, so that you don't sin. But if any man does sin, you need to understand you have an advocate with the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and that when we come to him, if we're faithful to confess our sins, he will be faithful to forgive yes. us of our yes. sins. Yes. And once that happens, once we fall short of the glory of God, and we realize that we fell short of the glory of God, we're to bring that to the Lord and we're to believe. We're to believe that what Jesus did was enough. Yeah. And that he wants to restore us. And then, we, you know what we do? We put that in the, that, that's the past. He removes our sin as far as the east is yes, from yeah. the west. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And he doesn't want to condemn. Now the enemy wants to condemn you. The enemy wants to tell you, look at you. You knew all this stuff about the message of the cross. You knew all this. And now look at you. You done fail. You're unworthy. You're guilty. You're, you, you know, Jesus doesn't. He's a liar. He's a liar in the Father of life. You're not going to fix it other than God's prescribed 
order, which is to, to look back to Calvary. Amen. We're looking to Calvary as we're walking in Christ and we're receiving the inflowing of grace to give yes. us the victory. Yes. Amen. Uh, right? Yes. Fruit, fruit just falling off the tree. Hallelujah. And then by some chance, if we've done wrong. And sometimes it's the small things. Right? I think it's in Song of Solomon. It's the, it's the small foxes, I think is what, how it says it, that, that spoil the vine. Yes. These, these little things. And, and, and look, sometimes we don't even realize it, but don't ignore it. Whenever you do something wrong, whether it's the way you talk to your hubby or your wifey, or whether you, that's weird to say it like that, but, or, or whether, whatever you do, whether it's at the boss or your friend, or you're condescending or you're rude, right, and you realize it, that may not seem like a big deal compared to the stuff you used to do, but now you're, you're growing and you're maturing in Christ. And so when you realize that, you don't have, listen, sometimes, well, I'll tell you that the Lord will oftentimes want you to go to your friend that you, now that's a whole nother level, but that's some good stuff right there. Amen. That's some good stuff. It'll produce humility in your heart. <laughs> but the first order of business is to get it right with the Lord. Right. Amen. To go to him and say, you know, because if you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, Y'all know, know, know that I was preaching to the prisoners today and I was like, it's very important that you gentlemen understand the difference, the difference between conviction and condemnation. Yes. Conviction of the Holy Spirit is a beautiful thing. You do not want to sear your conscience against the conviction of the Holy Spirit. If, you keep, if we as believers keep walking in rebellion and refuse to listen to the voice of God, we will sear our conscience. It doesn't mean he's going to give up on you. I'm not promising you that, but, but you take, why would we want to take a chance? Amen. Right? And he's gracious. He's merciful. He's kind. Amen. He's long-suffering. But, but you don't want to ignore the voice of God. All right. So doing and believing, right? And, you know, I remember I used to, I wrote a paper a long time ago, something to do with, at the old church I went to, like a teaching on something. And I was trying to describe the difference between works and, and grace, the difference between doing and believing, right? And in the, in the, uh, the analogy, I think I mentioned this the other night at Bible study, there was one guy and he's, he's in a, a, a rowing, like a, one of those row boats. You know what I'm talking about, the kind where you're trying to, you try to win, you know, the, with the long oars. What do you call it? Sculling, I think is what you call it. And so, you know, and, and he's over there doing it and he's working. He's working hard. He's sweating. And he's, and he's trying to get somewhere. But the harder he rows, he's not really, he's not really moving, right? And he's trying so hard to get there. And I mean, that's, that's the trial and the struggle of a Christian that's trying in his own strength to produce righteousness. You can't produce righteousness through your doing or through your through your own struggles and your own strength. You can't, there's no way. Righteousness is a gift. That's what it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 17. Righteousness is a gift that's given to you based upon what Jesus did for you at the cross. Right? But then Grace was a guy that was in a different kind of boat that was equipped with a sail. And then see the sail is his faith. Faith in the work of the Lord. And whenever the Holy Spirit, which is a good little analogy, because the Spirit in the yeah, Greek yeah. is pneuma, wind. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, y'all ever seen those people that race and they're over there, they race in them sailboats and they, the wind direction changes and they're like, okay, they turn up, turn that sail around and then they, they pull it up and then all of a sudden, pow, and you can hear the sail. Y'all ever seen that before? That, sit, that wind just fills that sail up and it just makes that loud sound because it just pops out almost like a rooster's chest. Like, boom! And then the next thing you know, here's that boat. And, and he, he ain't bringing no sweat, my friend. Like the, the wind, hallelujah, yes. it's carrying the boat. And, and, the, and the Holy Spirit is, carry, yes. is carrying us. He's the one that's doing the work. He's the one that's getting us where we need to go. That's good stuff right there. That's the Spirit of God doing it. Amen? All right, praise the Lord. And so we're almost done tonight. But I want to bring you back to Romans chapter 7, verse 9. All right. And I want you to see in Romans 7 verse 9 about that word revived. I want you to, I'm going to try to find it real quick if I can. This, this word is only used twice in the whole New Testament, in the Greek New Testament. The word for revived. The King James uses the word revived both times. 
and both times it's in the book of Romans. And the other time it's in chapter 14. And I want to try to I want to try to show you something if I can find it because I've got okay, here it is. It's in so so you see Romans chapter 7, verse 9. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And now look at Romans chapter 14, verse 9. It says, For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived. Now what I want you to see here with this word, and you can you can go back to chapter 7, verse 9. What I want you to see about this word revived. This is why I'm trying to tell you that this is not before he was a Christian. This was after he was a Christian. Because the very meaning of the word means, if you look it up in the Greek dictionary, it means something that was previously dead and it regains life. And see, the power of sin was is never truly dead in a person until they die. And we're going to go back and we're going to read it so I can prove it to you. But so, until they die, how? Till they die in Christ. There's a difference between dying physically and dying in Christ, correct? And so when we die in Christ, then we die to the power of sin, right? And so what I, what I want you to know is that what it was saying is, I was alive once without the law. How was that possible, Paul? Because when I got saved, see, I don't know about you, but when I first got saved, and listen, we don't always preach experience unless our experience lines up with the Word of God, right? And my experience, I believe, lines up with this. When I got saved that night, I told y'all that story where I went up to that altar, right? And I bowed my knee and I said, Jesus, I need you. I got up a different person, my friend. I'm telling you right now, I think I quit dipping for two weeks. <laughs> I quit drinking. I quit, and I, and I went on a boat. I read the whole book of Revelation. I got a job on a boat. And then the next thing you know, I'll come back. And, and, and people say, man, you made the best decision of your life. Now you got some stuff you got to do. And the next thing you know, it's not anybody's fault. But I started to slowly venture backwards. And that was the beginning of a 12-year process of really really struggling. But what I'm trying to tell you is I didn't know nothing when I went to that altar other than I needed Jesus. Amen. And, and, and the power of the cross set me free. Amen. And I was alive for that two week period, whenever it was just me and Jesus for that short period of time. And, 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 and I was alive apart from the law. But then when the commandment came, sin revived and, and I died. And so that's so what I wanted you to see here is that it describes something that was dead, but then it regains power. And so there's no time in a person's life that they can be free from the power of sin until they, because we've used the analogy, right? I think John mentioned it the other night and then, and then we got it from Lauren, where Lauren talks about the two toddlers, right? That you put them in the, you put them in the, in the same crib and you give them one rubber ducky, right? And you, and you back up. And they go to fight, right? We've seen it. I remember, well, I'm not going to say which. Well, it was Bella. You know, <laughs> Bella, Bella, my dad, and my dad fed it because I can remember her being in a high chair. And she said, Smines! And, and, and my dad liked that. He's like, he'd give her something and he'd say, It's Mines! And, and, and she was like, She was like, It's Mines! And, you know, because that's what that, and dude, she couldn't have been. 12 months old at the best. And so, look, look, you, you got to, no man, you don't, you don't act like that, right? You, you don't have to teach them the stuff that's in, right? It's already in man. And it starts to manifest itself, okay? And so, so sin can't be dead till a person dies in Christ, yeah. all right? And so, amen. So let's just take, let's just, we're going to close out with this few verses of scripture right here. Let's go to chapter seven and let's read verses one through five, okay? Now, what I want you to know is this. If you if you do like me and you dissect it word for word, you're probably going to end up in a place where I was for a little while. And what I need you to know, which can be a little bit confusing, okay? I think that the Lord has finally revealed to me what's going on here. So I'm going to try to help you out with this. Don't focus on who's dying in the story. Focus on this, that death change the relationship. Amen. Okay? Amen. John knows because he and I have been talking, arguing over this verse of scripture for 12 years. Okay. Death changed 
the relationship. Yeah, it's all right, good. and it's not a teaching on divorce. Divorce is not right, but that's not that's not what it's teaching on. Right, Jesus, but and Jesus loves us. Hallelujah! Right, and and, and, and He forgives us, and and if we go to Him, He restores us. Right, Hallelujah. but anyway, praise God. Thank God for that. Amen. Amen. All right. So look what it says. Know you not, brethren? For I speak to them that know the law. So He's talking about the law. How the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. Now. I want you to know, first of all, I want to be careful I don't overdo this, but look, he, he's writing to a Gentile church. You understand that? The Rome, Rome was not Jewish. Now, they probably had some Jewish believers in the Roman church, but there were also Gentiles in the Roman church. Okay, and so so when he's, when he's talking about the law, he, he's trying to explain to them the purpose of the law. And one of the purposes of the law is that it revealed God's righteousness before Jesus came upon the earth. You understand? And so he's saying that the law has dominion over a man. So the law has dominion. And the word dominion, if you look at some other translations, it'll say authority, has rule over. But the word dominion right there in the Greek is describing lordship. So whether anybody realizes it or not, whether they live in India, whether they live in China, whether they never even heard of the Jewish people, that doesn't matter. This is God's earth and this is God's plan. And God gave the children of Israel the law to reveal to humanity his holiness and his character. And, and what Paul's saying is the law has lordship over a man. Doesn't matter whether you know the law or not. That's, not. that's not the issue here. God put the law on the earth. And the law has lordship over a man or a woman, at least until they die. So let's keep it. So he's using marriage as an illustration. Does that make sense? He's not, he's not talking about marriage as much as he's using it as an illustration. Okay. He says, No, you not, brother, for I speak to them that know the law. How that the law has lordship over a man as long as he lives. For the woman, which has a husband, is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So let's look at this. So the husband is the law. And the wife is, is, the, is the bride. Can we look at it like that, right? That's what she is. So then if while her husband lives, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. So look, if you come into faith in Christ, through faith in Christ, and you have a relationship with God through faith in Christ, and you're told that faith in Christ and what he did for you at the cross is what you need. Like I think what John said, he said, tell my people to come back to my son for all they ever needed was what my son has done for them or something to that effect. Sorry, I messed it up. But, but the point is, come back to my son because what they, all they've ever needed is what he's done. The son has done it. Amen. And so when we come into Christ in relationship with Christ, we come into marriage with him. We come into yes. union with him yes. through faith in the right thing. You can't get saved if in some way, shape, or form. Now, you don't have to know all the details, but you gotta, you got you to gotta cry out to Jesus. And, and, and God gives you, God just goes, and he, has, he saved you. But it's because you're believing in Christ and what Christ did for you at the cross. That the payment of sin has been taken care of. Amen. But if you start now. So look, and this is another thing. I didn't mean to get into this this deep. But look, Colossians 2, 6 says this. The same way you received him, so shall you continue to walk in him. So the same way you received him through faith in him and what he did is the same way you continue to walk in him daily by faith in him and what he did. And now you're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And because you're now righteous in the eyes of God, he releases grace into your life that's empowering you. And now you're in, you're in a relationship with the Lord and it's like the wind of the Holy Spirit is blowing in the sail and you're going under the power of the Holy Spirit. But if you try to marry some other form of doctrine while you're married to Jesus, yes. now you're becoming a spiritual adulterer. Yes. And I don't care what it is. If you, and listen, let me be explicit. If you try to add something to Jesus for righteousness, that's where the spoke, that's where the stick in the spoke becomes a problem. 
Back whenever I was a young kid, I was a, y'all know, I, I, Lord, Lord changed me because I was obnoxious and had a big mouth. And my friends were always bigger than, older than me and tougher than me. And they're like, whenever that boy gets on that bicycle, there you go. Grab that broomstick right there and shove it in his spokes. And we're going to, and they, they've done that to me before. And that's what I'm doing. And I'm over there, like, I'm not even going to tell y'all some of the story. But look, this one time, that's what it was. They just shove that stick in the spoke. And the next thing you know, you're flying off the bike. And that's what ends up happening is that whenever you try to add something to Jesus, it's like you're putting a stick in the spoke. You're rolling along, you're going along, and then you add, so, and I don't care what I'm talking about, for righteousness, or for freedom, or for liberty, or for victory. No, it's him and him alone. It's what he did. And if we just learn to yield to that, we're going to be good as believers. That doesn't mean we're going to come into contact with some other people that are in a bind and need some help, and we got to take authority over some things in their life, praise God. But then if we don't teach them what I'm trying to teach you, they're going to be right back where they were before. Come on. Oh, okay, I could really get to going, but, but I'm, I'm just going to keep focused. All right. For the woman which has a husband is bound by law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband is dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So that if while her husband lives, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, look, he's going he's to clear it up for us what he's talking about. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Amen. So the whole thing's an analogy. You get that? The whole thing's an illustration. And, and that, and that the, as long as that, that, that man was alive... As long as that was alive, then that relationship was alive. And you were under law. But now, but now in Christ, we died. In Christ, we died with Jesus. So now we've been set free from a system of works, religious works, law, rule-based, performance-based Christianity, the doing of it. We've been set free from that. We've been set free so that we can just trust in Christ Amen. And what, and what he's done for us. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Listen, I'm not going to go through it too quick, but I had three things I wanted to tell you. Number one, let's talk about death. We die to sin. Romans 6, verses 1 through 2. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it? The scripture teaches us that when we came to faith in Christ, that we died to the power of of sin because it's talking about the sinful nature the noun of sin when we came to faith in Christ our old man died to the power of to, to relationship with sin so the relationship between us and sin was changed that relationship is dead I use that analogy of that old girlfriend right that she's alive I'm alive the relationship is dead amen and and that's the relationship with sin Sin is still there. It hasn't been taken out of you. The sinful nature has not been taken out of you. And it's important. Well, I'm not going to get into that. But it's important that people understand that the sinful nature is some legit stuff. And we need to understand that. Because, see, even after you're free from smoking weed and drinking beer and whatever, whatever you've been doing, guess what? There's some other things. Your bad attitude, pridefulness, that's all part of the sinful nature, okay? And so if you think that you're not still having a problem with it, no, that's part of your flesh and that's the sinful nature. And that needs to be crucified so that there can be a resurrection and the power of the Holy Spirit ministering in your life. All right, so we die to sin. We die to the law. We just learned that. So, so we don't want to re-engage a relationship with, with some kind of rule or regulation or some other adding something other than Jesus because that is what allows sin to regain power. But look at this. This is the last thing. Can you put Galatians 5.24 up there? Singers, musicians, y'all can come forward. Galatians 5.24 says this. We all, because I want you to know we also die to the flesh. And that's important. That's a big part of our Christian law. It says those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Amen. And it's all 
done by faith in what Christ has already done for us, period. And that's when we learn to rest in that as they're still coming up here and Jesus said, come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden, take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You will find rest for your weary soul. Can't even go to the cross yet. That's what he's talking about. Learn how to let him be the, the workhorse. Learn how to let him do the work, right? Believe that you are. Amen. Faith believing that you are a new creation in Christ. Amen? That the old things have passed away. And behold, that all things have become new. Praise God. And, and, do you, and, and when we believe that, and we begin to trust in that, then the Holy Spirit begins to respond to us. And he begins to reveal that to us. Amen. So I just want to encourage you tonight as we take time to worship the Lord. Look, the altars are always open.